Welcome to Writers and Readers. I'm Charlie Redner, and today I have a guest, Jim Gibson. Jim's written a memoir about Vietnam, and I told him before we did this show, this is going to be a difficult show for me to get through, because I remember those eras, that 1965 to 1975 were tremendous, and going through 1968 and reliving that again. But also, uh, like Jim, we had a parallel uh, I guess a parallel way we walked together, even though he was on the West Coast and I was on the East Coast. Jim Gibson, say hello to our audience. Hello, audience. <laughs> They're out there. Um, Jim, let's start there. Um, you wrote a book, and let's, let's get the title of your book up there, um, and we'll talk about how you got that title, because that title is amazing to me, that uh, not paid 11 cents an hour to think. Where did that come from? It's a chapter in my book. I have 60 chapters in my book, and that the title of my book is Not Paid 11 Cents an Hour to Think. Right. That was something that was drilled into our heads in the Army during our basic training uh, life. Okay. We were always told that we're not, we're not to think on our own. Okay. We're not smart enough to think. Okay. So one day during a bivouac, a <laughs> camping experience out in the boonies uh -huh. in basic training, uh, I had left my rifle uh, unattended in a foxhole, which was a cardinal sin oh in the army. God, you can I really can get in trouble that. for that. And I went <laughs> off to get some chow at lunchtime, and I came back with my chow, and mm -hmm. my, my buddy said, Gibson, you're in real deep trouble. <laughs> and I said, well, what's, what's going on? Well, the, the base commander came by on a, on a surprise visit with all of his entourage of drill Inspection. instructors and yeah. found your rifle in the foxhole, and he said, you're to report to the officer's mess tent. Oh, dear. I went, uh-oh, I'm dead. So uh, they brought me before the tent. I walked up there and I'm uh, thinking, <laughs> Who's, who knows what's going to happen to me? And they were drilling me and grilling me and insulting me, and I was standing at attention. And a young second lieutenant, a West Pointer, oh. thought he was going to have some fun and provide uh, mm -hmm. lunchtime entertainment for the colonel sitting right. there. And they were all sitting there watching me, and yes, sir, no, sir. He says, gets to a point, he says, Gibson, um, you know that what you did is a really bad offense, an army offense, don't you? And I said, yes, sir. He says, well, uh, I want you to tell me right now what your punishment should be. And then I realized, uh-oh, this guy's got something up his sleeve, yeah. and I better, I get, got, finally got to the point where I said, sir, Gibson does not know, sir. He does not know, sir. <laughs> he kept at me and at me, and finally I, I said, hmm, I got it. Private Gibson does not know, sir, because Private Gibson is not paid 11 cents an hour to think, sir. <laughs> and when I did that, the, I looked and I saw the colonel spit his mouth oh his food God. out, and they all yeah. just cracked up and embarrassed the yeah. hell out of the, uh, the West Pointer. And so he just says, oh, get down and do 100 push-ups and get back to your, yeah. your tent. Your so that's where the title came from. So that's that an interesting one, title. One, 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 one chapter in the book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but before we actually get into you and basic training and what you went through, um, as I say, we travel parallel paths. Um, tell me, what you had your draft card. You know you were in line to be drafted. And uh, before you got drafted, you probably thought about some options besides going over to Vietnam. What were they? Between a rock and a hard place. Mm -hmm. Basically, uh, I was uh, wondering what I was going to do. I, I didn't believe in the war. I was solidly against it. I'd participated in some anti-war activities. And uh, mm -hmm. I knew my draft notice was going to come at a certain month. Right. Because in those days, they would draft us by the thousands uh, alphabetically. And I it just calculated, I'm going to get my draft notice in June. Mm -hmm. So it was in May, um, uh, Memorial Day, I think it was, of 68, uh, I took off on a hitchhiking trip north to try to get into Canada. Okay. I had a backpack and a sleeping bag and the whole thing, and I was thinking I'll go escape. Okay. It didn't work out for me. I, uh, I tried it, but I, I became discouraged on the road after about a month and called home and had a talk with my mom, and she said, Jim, your draft notice has come, and um, your dad and I really do believe the best thing for you would be come home and face it. Okay. And I went back out to my cabin. I'd rented a small cabin on the beach mm -hmm. in Oregon at the time. I thought a lot about it, and finally I said, you know, I guess maybe they're right. Well, you also ran into 
Eugene McCarthy and his troops who were yes. out promoting stop the war and vote me. I want to be president and uh, I'll stop this war. Tell me just a little about how that happened. Because of my opposition to the war, I was uh, do, trying to do something, become involved in something that would be a be, be positive. Yes, we were supporting a candidate at that time in '68 uh, uh, who was running for president. His name was Eugene McCarthy, and right. he was the anti-war candidate. Yes, he was much more so than even Bobby Kennedy. Absolutely, at the time. I agree to that. Uh, but. Um, so we, I went door to door in Orange County in those, time, those years, those months with my older sister, passing out literature and canvassing for him. Finally, when I was on my backpacking trip, trying, going north, mm -hmm. uh, and it was in downtown Portland one day when uh, I, I got the opportunity to see Eugene McCarthy deliver an incredible uh, uh, political speech uh, there in downtown Portland where he just fired up the crowd and mm -hmm. electrified everybody. And well, I can remember that very vague. Yeah. You know, I just remember that he was the anti-war candidate. Now, I was on the East Coast where I said we had parallel paths. Um, rather than running off to Canada, I made the decision to join the National Guard and get rid of my military obligation that way. But I also got involved in, in politics, and I'm one of three people who literally grabbed Bob Kennedy and brought him down to southern New Jersey to campaign. He had just announced maybe a week before, and then two weeks later, President Johnson, I mean, the Vice President Johnson said he wasn't going to be running, or President Johnson. And so uh, what happened was that um, I ended up with, when Bobby got killed, 1968 was such a horrible year. I mean, just, uh, just I, I wrote down here because it's, it's hard to remember. Uh, in January, the Pueblo, January 2, the Pueblo was captured by North Korea. In April 4th, Martin Luther King was uh, assassinated. June the 6th, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. And November 8th, Nixon became president. There's my 1968 for you. So we worked for um, Bobby Kennedy and then George McGovern, and we ended up... Um, George actually ran in 68. A lot of people don't even know that. Uh, after Bobby died, he, he jumped in the race, which was like a month before the convention. So nothing came of that. But um, they were terrible times. And, they were uh, terrible. So uh, you ended up, um, I guess, I wanted to make this point because I just recently read it in that uh, McNamara book that President John Kennedy had signed an order to bring back some of our troops from Vietnam um, just a matter of weeks before he was assassinated. So maybe things had gone terribly wrong, obviously, then, but uh, they might have been different. What's your opinion on that? I think you're right. I think uh, JFK would have gotten us out of Vietnam, and it would have been a whole different story. Yeah. His assassination was just a, the most terrible thing. That's, our country went through a lot of change mm -hmm. after his assassination. Absolutely did. Yeah. yeah. Johnson and then, and then Nixon. So um, <clears throat> I have a, you are an artist as well as a fabulous writer, and we have some art, and I wanted to show some of it. The first one I wanted to show is a painting you did of Dean Rusk, uh, Lyndon Johnson, and Robert McNamara putting their heads together, trying to figure out what to do next after... Uh, president was killed and, and they took over the reins. So um, can you tell me why you decided to, to paint those three uh, politicians? I was out to uh, illustrate what the war was really all about. Mm -hmm. And I write in my book how uh, most of my friends, and uh, when I was going to college the year before I got drafted, most of us were really against the war. And we felt a lot of resentment against these uh, older guys, these older politicians mm -hmm. that uh, were forcing it, in, forcing it upon us. Yeah. It's what they wanted. It wasn't right. what we wanted at all. And I had a lot of resentment against these men. And in my, uh, my piece, um, my painting, uh, I said, well, these were the, uh, the men that brought us into it. So that's mm -hmm. why I, I yeah. painted that. They absolutely did. And you brought something to mind since we've been talking since... Uh, I met you that what I never even thought and realized that 
99%, I guess, of the, of the people over in Vietnam, our soldiers, um, didn't want to be there either, uh, except for maybe a small group that were so gung-ho that that was something they wanted to do, but never realized that we were all non-war um, you know, advocates. Well, I wouldn't go that far. I would say that a lot of us were not into that war at all. Um, the average soldier that I knew in Vietnam had, was a draftee, like mm -hmm. myself. Sure. A young guy. I was 20 when I got there. Right. And uh, we weren't really, we didn't want to go to that war. Of course not. And uh, th of course, there were some, some younger guys or some guys that were career yeah. soldiers. They wanted to make a career out, out I, of the military. I bumped into them. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but, but nine out of 10 of us were draftees, I yeah. think. And, and a lot of us just thought, what am I doing here? Yeah, you know? why were we there in the first yeah, place? Yeah. And, you know, it just brings to mind, we were talking about how you and I were trying to do anything to avoid the draft. What's happening over in Russia now? There's 100,000 young men over there trying to find a way to get out of a war that they don't want anything yeah. to do with. It's a long, long problem that humanity has, mm -hmm. war. Mm -hmm. And it probably isn't going to solve it in our lifetime, right? <laughs> I highly doubt it. I doubt it, too. The next uh, piece of art I wanted to show, because it scared the living daylights out of me, is two of your uh, training uh, sergeants over there with the, I guess they are have mohawks. I mean, that, that looks scary to me, those two guys. What well, happened there? Well, they, were, they wanted to look scary. <laughs> uh, that photograph, that pa I, I did that painting from a photograph that I discovered in a bookstore in Laguna right. Beach. Oh, OK. Uh, T t 10 years <laughs> after I came home from the war. And there it was, a double spread of my drill instructor and a, and a <laughs> lieutenant. I go, wow. Oh. The guy on the left, um, he was our, our head. Are they the real ones that, that you had? Well, really? the guy on the left was. The guy on the yeah. right, I didn't know him, okay. the officer. But the drill instructor on the left, I did know. He was the uh, head drill instructor of my uh, training company, company basic right. training. Yeah. And he was a he was a frightening kind of guy, and wow. that that's what they wanted to to appear well, you to be. Show, you achieved that with that photograph. Uh, yeah. And then the next photograph, or the, it actually is, um, I think it is a photograph of you as uh, the recruit. You um, you graduated from basic training, and I don't even know if that might even be after your advanced training. Um, the artwork that you did. A view in uniform with a. I think it's a photograph. Oh, that's actually a, a basic training photograph that I was in my a basic training album. They gave you an right. album like when you okay. were in high school, you know. Yeah. And uh, uh, that was when I had been in the army about less than two weeks, I think. Right. Mm -hmm. Your book is. Um, it's got three major sections, and um, we're going to talk about the first and the second more than the third. Uh, the first one is uh, before uh, you go into uh, training and the war. The second section is Vietnam, and the third is a returning veteran. So we're going to talk about the first and the third because we all of a certain age watch that war on television and really don't need reminders of how horrible that situation was. And um, I wanted to um, just talk about that. So you have another piece of art that you did They're called the Hooch maids. What are the hooch maids? And uh... well, in Vietnam, on the large bases and even on the smaller bases, uh, the army would hire civilians to come onto the bases to do all kinds of labor, uh -huh. and then they would clean out our hooches, our tents. Okay. Okay. They would wash our clothes. They would. Uh, uh, and they were uh, paid every... by the army. Yes, they were paid by yeah. the United States government. Okay. And. Um, Paid very little. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. But it was a lot better than starving to death. Oh, yeah. And so that oh. was one of the policies that the United States had was to do whatever we could to uh, help the people get through this war. Get through the war and help them, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next piece of art that you did is you and a pooch, or a little dog. You found oh, a dog on hog the post. Jaws. Huh? Hog jaws. Oh, yeah. uh, that, that's, uh, the title of the painting is Dog Tags. Okay. And actually, uh, that's the, t the title of the chapter in the book, Dog Tags. The story of, uh, of our company dogs and an, an event. Now, they're that, precious, that, uh, and they're, they're, you know, I guess a real welcome to the, to the what was it, a company located? Yeah, we were in a small medical unit out, out of, at a place called Bearcat, which was, oh, it was about 
15 miles to the southeast, or to the east of Saigon, uh -huh. in that area, out in the boonies. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we, we were a small mass unit, which meant we had one MD, a doctor who was the company commander, right. and about a dozen of us medics, and a, okay. a few other personnel. Right. And uh, we, we, we had a couple of dogs that we had adopted. Okay. I don't know where they came from. Right. They were mutts. Yep. And one of them was named uh, Greg, and the other one was named Hogjaws. But well, didn't one of them disappear for well, a while, yeah, and um, you had to go out and capture them? And well, yeah, back. the story was this. <laughs> one day we realized that Greg wasn't around. And we said, where is Greg? Uh -huh. he's, he's missing. Because we all love Greg. Yeah. And uh, some, we, we figured it out. A guy had been transferred out of our unit. And he, he was a clerk, I think. And transferred down into the Delta uh -huh. with another unit down there. We figured it out. He took Greg. Oh. So we concocted a little mission. One of our Getting guys, back. one of our guys knew a helicopter pilot, so he got his. his this is real serious business to get yes, your dog is. back, right? Yeah, serious. <laughs> Bigger than anything else. Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine. I really. We can. wanted our dog back. Yeah. So we got a, this warrant officer got on his little helicopter, and a couple of guys jumped in. We located the base. I wasn't on the mission. Yeah. Flew down into the into the base and located the barracks and ran right in, grabbed Greg, got him right back out. And so on the comm line, then we heard of, you know, uh, okay, we got him, we're coming back, we're coming back to Barracks. So we were all excited, you know, and uh, jumping up and down. And here comes the helicopter, you know, blowing dust and yeah. sand and everything. And the pilot had to, had to just let us, let everything, he said, just jump out. I've got a real mission now. So yeah. the guy jumps out with Greg, puts him on the ground, and Greg's, you know, looking around and the yeah. helicopter blades are swirling. What are doing here? And so out of nowhere it goes, Hogjaws sees this thing, it sees what's happened. He runs right out and he immediately gets into a dog fight with Greg. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so the helicopter's buzzing <laughs> up. So I ran out and I grabbed I grabbed Hogjaws and yeah. come on, buddy, calm down, buddy. So a guy took a picture of me at that instant right there and right. I'm holding hog jaws yeah. in my arms and um, that's the, the story that's behind the story behind that painting. Wow. Wow. So um, now you you put your time in. Uh, you, you got a brief uh, vacation down to Australia, I understand, and you came back and you eventually um, filled your time and and came home. You did an illustration, or it's a photograph of you when you returned, and you have that look in your eye that I can't explain. But you look lost to me. I believe you're re you're referring to the, my passport photograph. Yeah, yeah. Uh, after the, I came home from the war, I felt like I didn't fit in any into the well, society. You weren't treated very well, right? I mean, you weren't nah, we received weren't. at home, and you weren't received in the neighborhood or anybody. I remember specifically. Yeah. Obviously, it, it it wasn't good for Vietnam vets. They weren't honored in any way. They weren't saluted. They weren't. Feeded, they just came home. I wanted to get out of the country. So I took my jungle money, couldn't spend it over there on anything, so I saved it in a bank and I said, I'm going I'm going to Europe. Okay. So before I left I took that passport photo had that passport photograph taken of yeah. me. And uh, it was a great trip getting out of America and just Spending the whole spri late spring and early and most was of the summer. Was it your brother was in Germany? Or My brother was in the U.S. Air Force in Berlin, Germany. Okay. And he, he had a great job. He worked as a military police guy oh, an for the Air Force at Tempelhof Air Base in Berlin. He knew Good the duty. town really well. He knew where all the great bars were and all the fun stuff was. Mm -hmm. So we just had a good time. And we took off. He took a month leave. And we, we drove all down south through Nuremberg and then into Munich, the beer halls. And uh -huh. down, we drove through Italy. the Alps and, and uh, down into to Milan, Italy, yes. down to the boot of Italy, and took a car ferry across the Adriatic to northern Greece and then drove down to Athens. And, I mean, it was a it was a trip of a lifetime for oh, a young same, guy yeah. who just gotten out of the military, yeah. who was free and you know, 21 years old, and, oh, and that was wonderful. A, a great, it was a great release. Did that reset you a little bit? Was it better when you came home from Europe than it was uh, when you it came did. home from? Nam? I came home and I I felt just a, a lot better about things. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, and the. I guess a few years after that, or maybe many years after that, you decide you're going to go back there. And why did you decide to go back, and what did you do when you got back? Throughout the years, 
I just couldn't get away from the Vietnam uh, thing. I just felt a need to return. Mm -hmm. I felt the need to try to do something of a positive nature for the people there. Mm -hmm. and it kept at me all those years. And so finally in 1993, I took a trip back to Vietnam with other Vietnam veterans. Mm -hmm. And uh, we spent more than a month there on a, a, a mission. It was, a, it, was, it was to be known as a peace walk, mm. a citizen's diplomatic mission to, to establish uh, reconciliation with the people there, mm -hmm. to put the war behind us, and to try to do something positive for the people there. Now, did you meet anyone there that you might have bumped into in Saigon or the area when you were there? Not at all, no. no. But you had an experience while you were in Nam during the war uh, of probably being in an area where you shouldn't have been, where it was just... Um, in a residential area and... Oh, uh, you're probably talking about my little trip. My, I had an in-country R&R, yes. a three-day R&R to a place called Vung Tau, which was uh -huh. a resort town out to the east of Saigon, a beautiful tropical paradise. Right. Uh, little did I know that it was actually controlled by the v v Viet Cong. Yeah, they were just VC more group. interested in the graft and everything and making profits from the place. Gotcha. And, uh, but anyway, I got into a pedicab one day and I said, uh, uh, the old 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 guys that used to pedal them around, we mm -hmm. called them Papa Son. Mm -hmm. He was wearing his conical Vietnamese hat, and I said, "Here's uh, Papa Son, just uh, some money. Pedal me around the, the town. I just would like to see it." And so he says, "Okay, get get in." And so you know, I'm riding in the front of this three wheeled bicycle, yes. and, and we're having a good time looking at the sights. And suddenly he turns off the main drag, and he goes down this alleyway, and we're going down a hill into a a neighborhood that looks a little suspicious to mm. me. And how did it look suspicious? Just well, didn't feel uh, right? Yeah, there, there were no GIs. Okay, that's a good start. And no Americans. It was all uh, ethnic Vietnamese people living in their, their um, dwellings. Mm -hmm. And it was a crowded tenement situation, three stories, I think. Mm -hmm. When I got down to the bottom there, into this little area there, uh, people came out of their dwellings and began laughing at me. <laughs> I thought, uh-oh, uh, maybe I, be I better maybe get I out of here. Be here. Yeah. Uh, so I said, uh, Papa-san, let's, let's go on out of here. So he was okay. And I was realizing that the, uh, they were looking at this stupid young GI that had made a bad mistake. And Absolutely. They let me go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you went back after the war then and you uh, were able to mingle, uh, how did that feel to you and what was it like meeting the Vietnamese that probably were VC while you were... It was a wonderful experience. Really? I oh, drank so beer with guys that. that were in the, in the Viet Cong. Yeah. And we all put it behind us. We, mm. we, uh, we, we apologized for what we, none of us wanted to do. Right. Uh, and, uh, um, along the way, I gave, made donations to clinics, to veterans centers, and uh, uh, women's hospitals and things like that. And yeah. wherever we went, uh, we were accepted just very Oops. warmly. Yeah. We had two goals in mind. One's to establish uh, diplomatic relations. First, the in, in the United States embargo of Vietnam, which we had been carrying on ever since the war ended in 1975. Mm -hmm. This was 1993. Right. And so we said, we, 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 we should stop this, this vengeance and just let them participate in the world economy like... Uh, right. China or, mm -hmm. or uh, any other country, Thailand or right, what wherever, and uh, let's stop this and let's get uh, an embassy started and going over there. And uh, a few months after we we uh, came home from that trip, mm -hmm. uh, 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 things were happening, and uh, eventually oh, they got the, the embassy. And mm -hmm. now Vietnam is one of our favorite trading oh, partners. Absolutely, I think yes. this shirt is probably. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Probably. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, too, um, even though you were drafted and you had to go to war, you decided on a um, vocation that would do more than just uh, put a rifle on your back and go look for uh, bad guys. What did you decide to do? Oh, well, when I got drafted, I, I sort of made a deal with myself. I didn't believe in this war, and I thought, well, if they're going to send me over there, I'm going to do it in a way that will help save people and will not hurt or kill people. Okay. So I did everything that I possibly could to become an army medic. 
and I, was, I su succeeded. They did send me to a, a combat medics training school in Fort Sam Houston, Texas, uh -huh. where I was trained before I was sent to Vietnam. Okay, and so you did that through the war. So you kind of felt like you had to be there and you might as well do something that's more favorable to vanity than, than shooting at the people in the jungle. Yeah. So, yeah. There, there, are, there are young men in every war that don't want to kill people. And so sometimes mm -hmm. the option is open to, for them to, to do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. The downer to that is it can be extremely dangerous because you're out in the line of fire quite often. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a large number of, of uh, Army and uh, Navy medics that have really given everything. And, uh, so. Oh, absolutely. I mean, because they're there right there when it's happening and, yeah. and uh, it's just... I was very fortunate to get through it. Uh, I, I just Without like, a ding, right? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Except what it does to your head, I guess, when you came back and, and it, it lingers on. And, um, oh, we, we've got it. Well, you know, your dad, my yeah. dad, we've talked exactly. about that. Exactly. We talked about that. They, mm -hmm. came they were both war veterans. PTSD and, and... They have went through a lot. The only, only thing they uh, had then to... To, to help recover was was alcohol, and they sure they sure took advantage it. of that, didn't they? My dad did, big yeah, time. Mine and, too. Uh, yeah. So, wow. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about. Uh, it took a while to write the book, and we're running out of time. But um, why did it? It took till what two years ago for you to get around to trying to write this. I had written the central part, my actual experience of the war itself quite a few years ago, but I kept it just locked away. And right. When, when the COVID pandemic struck, um, I'm an artist and I have a studio, at, yeah. which are uh, nearby, yeah. but we couldn't paint. I just didn't feel like painting. And for so about a year, I just turned my creative uh, self into, into, into writing, writing and book. focusing on producing this book. Was it lethargic for you? I mean, did it make you feel better that you had gotten that down? Absolutely. Yeah. And I want to say the best part of this experience has been its reception from the guys that I've served with, okay. who I've sent copies to, uh -huh. and other, other vets who have read it, and uh, uh -huh. uh, the, the great uh, uh, feeling of camaraderie that I've been able to achieve with my old buddies. Well, Jim, we're going to have to say goodbye for now, but you should come back on with your artwork and just do a whole thing on your art, has even the things that don't have anything to do with Vietnam and the war because you are a, you're a joy to talk to. I am so proud to know you. I'm so honored that what you went through, what you did for us. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you very much for having me here. Okay, we'll see you guys the next time. Remember, 1030 on Mondays. Writers and readers, take care. <laughs>